pickles and live streams. I got my head did. It's pretty and red. Oh man, it always quits. To, they need to make song length versions of these 80s songs and theme songs. I got my hair did. I dyed it red. It's beautiful, yeah. Eating pickles and doing some live streams, yeah. We got some coffee too. It's Simon and Simon because the blonde guy is also in Prince of Darkness. What's his name? Jameson Parker, forgotten 80s guy. And Gerald McCraney with 80s porn stash. And Jameson Parker was the. This is going to flag my channel, by the way. Jameson Parker was the city slicker. And he worked with Gerald McCraney, the redneck. And they solved crimes in San Diego. Or actually, the building where their private detective office was, was in San Diego. What's all the detective shows in the... Uh, 70s and 80s. It was just detectives everywhere. Private detectives everywhere. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Jay's analysis. Yeah, dude, that sax part goes wild, doesn't it? Yeah, I got my hair did. It's fully gingerized now. Hope you guys like it. I got my hair did for YouTube. I hope you guys like it. Hey, YouTube. I'm going to do like every stupid ass YouTuber. Hey YouTube, I oh, got my hair done. What do you guys think? Uh, it's so gay. Uh, it's a gay enough. Uh, you'll never see us coming. Vindictive, vitriolic victuals, vandalizing vaginas. Vroom, vroom, vroom. I am V, and I am a vagot. Not V, the YouTuber. <laughs> That was, uh, remember how he always did alliteration? Like Mark Dice, V. V does alliteration like Mark Dice. When I got that stupid mask for skits and stupid stuff, I went to the uh, Halloween store and I said, give me the Guy Fox mask. And the guy goes, the what? I said, the Guy Fox mask from V for Vendetta. And he goes, the what? I said, you don't have... A V for Vendetta Guy Fox mask. And he goes, the what? <laughs> uh, so I just had to go find the thing myself. The the guy who was at least 25 or 30 uh, didn't know what I was talking about. I'm like, it's a very, very recognizable pop culture image. You don't know what I'm talking about? So then I went and got my hair did for the show for you guys. Hope you like it. It's red for YouTube, uh, for commies. It's red for Marxism. Guy Fox. He probably thought I was saying it. Fox, like F-O-X-X. -X. Is that like Jamie Fox? Guy Fox. Anyway. I hope you guys had the chance between last night and to <laughs> today to watch all three of the John Carpenter movies. <laughs> I did. Well, sort of. Of course, I've seen them a million times, but that's okay. And of course, we are taking super chats. Nobody likes to do super chats during the movie analyses. I'm not sure why they're supremely entertaining. Voted best esoteric movie analysis podcast in the world and on YouTube. Of course, there's not a whole lot of competition, but that's okay. That keeps us easily at the top of our niche. Number one of the charts, baby. But I guess you guys don't like my movie analyses, even though that's what kind of started this whole thing going, right? But you can show your love if you do like my movie analyses by leaving some super chats or asking some super chat questions. <clears throat> Hopefully we won't lose our monetization through 
playing the Simon and Simon theme song. So, what do we have first? The thing. The thing, you know, the thing with the thing, and then the people, and the thing, you know, with the thing, right? There is the thing. That thing. This is uh, obviously one of John Carpenter's best films. Uh, there's no question about that. The thing is one of the best of his his canon. Let's get that sexy lesbian ant creature up there. One of the things. <laughs> um, and I think there's a Cold War element to it. This was uh, proposed by a guy who used to write for Sold East a while back. Uh, and he had an interesting analysis of the thing. And he pointed out some of the Cold War stuff going on in the background. And I was like, I don't, I've never thought about that. But I guess, yeah, right? And so if we think about Invasion of the Body Snatchers, right? We think about how that was Cold War era. And that was Cold War propaganda. That was part of the commie dialectic. And it continues into the 70s, right? The supposed commie threat. But the Soviets are going to take us over. Oh, but secretly, let's let the Rand Corporation build the military industrial complex. And how is there a Cold War element? Well, Wilford Brimley. I'm just looking up some of the great Beatus memes here of Wilford. There's one, yeah, this is this is my favorite one of Wilford here. Wilford is American in the narrative, but he looks like Gorby, doesn't he? That's my favorite Wilford Brimley meme. He he has a very Gorby appearance, right? He doesn't have the the uh the Gorby spot, the Gorby drip, but he does have a Gorby appearance in the film. And he doesn't drink uh, scotch like Kurt Russell's character does, McCready, right? Uh, he drinks vodka. And you'll notice at the beginning there's a chess match that Kurt Russell's playing, right? He's playing computer chess, and there's all these tech instruments everywhere, right? Throughout the movie, you'll see constantly... John Carpenter pictures the camera, the, the camera behind a bunch of technological implements, be they stereos, be they whatever. And I started noticing, having seen the movie about 10 times now, that I think a lot of this is intentional, right? There's stuff that's going on in the background. It's being put there on purpose. And so I'm not saying that Wilfred Brimley is like overtly a, a Russian mole or something. I think it does have that. It does evoke that idea though. Cause he looks like Gorby. He doesn't have his walrus stash in the movie. Um, he's drinking vodka and he's a rival scientist, you know, to the rest of the team, especially towards as the, the narrative uh, continues. And he's put in quarantine. They quarantine Wil <laughs> Wilford Brimley, uh, get over there, Wilford in the, in the quarantine shack. Here's a bottle of vodka. Please yourself until we decide you can come out of timeout. So uh, this, I think, signifies, again, the Cold War battle. You've got the different scientific outposts there where they've discovered this crazy stuff in Antarctica. And uh, I'm looking for, I'm sorry, I'm looking for some memes that I had pulled up that were funny. Where'd they go? So we don't exactly know what's going on at this this uh, outpost, but it's all of the humans end up having to unite against the external threat. And possibly even the Cold War is being portrayed as a dialectic that we have to be worried about. Uh, I do think there's something to that. Especially if you think about it. this was 1982. This was you know Cold War era still. Pink Floyd and Ronald Reagan had not torn down the wall yet, so we're still. I don't think I'm going to be able. To, where am I? Where is that damn meme? Was the uh, alien the Nazi uh, Atlantis? Nazi bases in uh, Antarctica, right? Antarctica, Antarctica, and I can't talk today. 
Antarctica, Nazi Antarctica, which of course is the uh, you know this proves the uh, flat Earth, right? Because the Nazis discovered this, and then the Masons <laughs> covered it up, and then that's where Hitler was secretly hiding when he didn't die. Yeah, this is what John Carpenter... Although, by the way, they do actually find a Foo Fighter, right? They do discover that this crashed Foo Fighter is an alien life form. Still no Super Chats. Thank you very much. We'll continue <laughs> doing movie analyses with no Super Chats. I'll just load up the screen with, uh, with Nazis and Wilford Brimley. Until this makes you give me a super chat about this, right? The ultimate alien terror is Wilford Brimley. Because it's a secret Illuminati plot to give everybody the Beatus. Give them all the Beatus. Give them all the Beatus. <laughs> yeah, here we go. And I'm going to hide over here behind these. So... Is there uh, some reference to the esoteric Nazi elements of uh, Antarctica? I don't know. I don't know. The myth of... Well, actually, by the way, there was a Nazi base in Antarctica. That was actually true. Did you know that? Uh, But it's not Nazis that are the villains here. We don't know where this saucer comes from it just flies in out of space it's like they are from another planet and i'm cracking up at all the flat earth nazi based stuff <laughs> let's see here's a good one here's a, this is an actual photo of the ice wall flat earth and then if you if you actually make it to the ice wall there's a giant nazi base the, the Nazis, see, they left. They went to the to the other pools that are out there because we live in a giant infinite plane. And uh, here's some other exclusive real images. This one says it's exclusive, so it is. <laughs> These crack me up, dude. These are funny. Is John Carpenter uh, referring to any of this stuff? <laughs> Look, that's real, dude. Check that out. Weekly World News. Anyway, so we're not talking about Nazis, though. It's Cold War setting. It's Cold War. Let's get back to reality here. Cold War setting. Wilford drinks vodka. Science outpost. Kurt Russell's playing chess on his computer. So we're being set up to know that this is going to be a, a movie about the dialectical chess game of global geopolitics. The 20th century and its Cold War dialectic. Of course, as we said, this is the beginning of John Carpenter's loosely titled Apocalypse Trilogy. Thank you, Eric Thompson, for the $10. Surf Nazis. So, what is going on here? Um, I think that what John Carpenter is talking about is the technocratic danger. It's It's technocracy that he's warning about. And that's because there are all these shots where you see tech like right in the camera. And no, I didn't have time to like gather them all together. But uh, if you go watch the movie, you'll see what I'm saying. Uh, There's even scenes where you see the dog, you know, the one that gets the initial bite. He's got like metal. There's a shot where there's in the background, there's saws in the background that are on the wall. And it looks like they're coming out of his back and it actually foreshadows Later in the narrative, when the red licorice whips whip from his posterior, John Carpenter loves gooey ghoulies uh, and red licorice whips flying out of things. That's a, a staple of John Carpenter movies. Gooey, gooey, skeet, 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 ghoulies. <laughs> That's that they they do have an extremely gooey nougat appearance to them, don't they? All right, once I start talking about gooey ghoulies and skeet, 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 enroll the Super Chats. So it's a technocratic warning, I think. We're being warned about (laughs) the 
uh, dangers of diabetes being given to the population through the propaganda of Wilford Brimley. No, I'm joking. The dangers of tech. And not just tech, but technology in its dark sorcerer forms, alchemy. Because what do they say about these entities in this movie? They say that they are able to mimic, right? They mimic reality and they take over the host and their GMO. They're genetic, genetically modified. Where's my picture? I have a picture of, yeah. They're genetically modified, like part spider, part human, part dog. It's it's like, it's the warning, I think, of the dangers of tech. Dark tech, sorcery, GMO. I think that's what he's talking about. Now, if you read my analysis that I have of invasion of the body snatchers you'll see that i make the same argument there and that's because the thing is actually another version of invasion of the body snatchers uh, and if you watch the 70s invasion of the body snatchers it's a little more clearly um elements of genetic modification interspecies splicing going on now, that's not something that just the Nazis did. They did do that, though. That was uh, tested in Nazi stories, at least. There's the story where they tried to, the Nazis tried to put a dog head on a different body, uh, and then they claimed that they transmuted metal or something like that. That's probably all nonsense. But this was going on uh, by scientists in Germany as well as in the U.S., as well as in the Soviet Union. And that's because in the grand scheme, these are all fake systems. They're systems that are paid for by corporatists and bankers. They're not real. That's why you hear me constantly talk about this. Quigley talks about it. <clears throat> so you have the poor pooch, right? He gets infected with this. Again, more spider elements to this thing. Uh, that's another picture that's good here. Now that's not the right picture. Where'd it go? There we go. Yeah. It's kind of like if you watch Society and there's a guy who comes out of a butt in the movie Society. <laughs> Which is really good, by the way. I reposted that old uh, analysis we did of Society. But uh, it's, a, it's a great movie. You should watch it if you've never seen Society. One of these B-movies with a message. So... We're getting the synthoid here, right? The, uh, yes, Nazis were theosophists, correct. The synthoid, the idea of the NPC, but not just the NPC in like a text. Well, it is kind of in the text sense, right? The creation of the mindless drone. Um, genetically modified red licorice hybrid synthoid NPC goblin creatures. Uh, it also has the ability to spit silly string. It spits a lot of silly strings, skeet, skeet, skeet. And I had that confirmed by asking, I asked little John what that was. And he said, yeah, yeah, it is skeet, skeet, skeet. So that is confirmed. So again, keep in mind, it's a scientific outpost. They're quote scientists. They discover alien technology, you know, classic kind of UFO Foo Fighter, X Files type plot, and this 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 alien tech has apparently led the scientists into studying the specimens, and this has led to some sort of morphing of the genome, the biosphere into its uh, Cthulhonic. That's my new word, Cth Cthulhic, Cthulhonic uh, type inversions and and abominations that begin to uh, arrive on earth and that of course is going to be the theme throughout the apocalypse trilogy now as we move past the giant vaginal cavity that wilford brimley penetrates and it gives commentary on if you're ever wondering what it was would be like for to see wilford brimley penetrate a giant gooey vaginal cavity you, you do get to see this. Uh, and 
I do think the the entity uh, does have that appearance on purpose. But it's 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 good in that in that um, John Carpenter way, right? I mean, what I'm saying probably sounds very disgusting. If you haven't seen the thing, come on, you got to see the thing. It's 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 a great movie. Uh, and I'll let you watch Wilford Brimley climb into the giant alien vagina. I can't, I can't mimic that. It's it's too precious. But this moves us then into the second act, right? The second act of the thing involves the story focusing on who is infected. And again, this is was a prominent narrative at the time of the Cold War about the idea of the commies infecting you and you wouldn't even know it. Right? You would get infected with the, the commies are hidden amongst us and we don't even know it. We can't figure out who they are. And so enter in the blood test. Now, is this a Nazi purification test of the uh, vagina monologues? That's a pretty good comment there. Is this a uh, blood purification test? Uh, I don't think so. Kurt Russell is not representing the Nazi forces. He represents America, Americanism, obviously, always. He does the same in Big Trouble in Little China. Aw, oh, come on, Wang. Right? Kurt Russell's always Americanism. Um, so what does it represent? Well, it could have reference to the AIDS. Instead of everybody getting the beatus through Wilford, this is the beginning of the AIDS. Who's getting the AIDS? Has everybody got the AIDS? And maybe are, were we being prepped for AIDS? Do you got the AIDS? Are you a bug chaser? Who's got the AIDS? I don't know. That's just one theory. And by the way, if you watch the old AIDS clips, I'm talking about old news clips that you can find on YouTube about the AIDS. Uh, they said at first it was cancer, right? It's like you got the gay cancer. There's a new cancer. So it could have been at this time they thought, oh, there's a new bioweapon, you know, that's out there that the, uh, that the Reds are going to give us. The Reds are going to give us some kind of new uh, gay bomb, the AIDS bomb. And by the way, there are clips of the Pentagon discussing the the gay bomb. Did you know about that? Uh, one of the it's probably just just uh, Pentagon propaganda, but there was an old clip of uh, you can look it up uh, where they talk about how there was a discussion of dropping the gay bomb on I think Saddam's troops is either Saddam or Gaddafi. <laughs> They're like. We're going to drop the gay bomb, and it'll turn all of uh, the troops gay. Well, I think they have dropped the gay bomb in America, haven't they? Um, sorry if you were disappointed. I didn't actually get my hair did. Uh, that was a wig for all you dupes out there. I did get a new boomer hat, though, which features the <coughs> Florida Flamenco. Now... By the way, what is going on at the polls, right? I mean, I don't believe in the flat earth, and I don't believe in some dumbass ice wall from uh, a Game of Thrones, but did you see the, what are they, it's called a tabular iceberg? Did you guys see this? There is some weird shit that goes on at the, at the polls. And I don't know what it is. I'm not sure anybody really knows. But the, now, of course, we can't believe NASA. NASA is, is a lying institution. Uh, the fact that NASA lies, by the way, does not prove flat Earth. But there was the tabular iceberg. What the heck is that? Uh, and they saw it was just a natural formation. It just happens to, to uh, fall off in chunks into perfect squares. Eh, I don't know if I believe that. I mean, I guess that's possible. But... It does seem weird. It seems like maybe maybe some kind of scalar technology where they're heating this up or something. I don't know. That does exist. Uh, or this is actually just a fake image. I mean, NASA is 
an institution that does psyops. Are you not aware of this? Right? They actually do fake things because they are under the aegis of the Air Force and the Air Force newsflash: the Air Force does psyops. Did you know that? So I don't know. I don't know what the. I mean, I know that there's the phenomenon of the tabular iceberg, right? I spent like all night looking at this just because it was fascinating. But uh, I did, by the way, when I was doing my undergraduate or my, actually grad research, one day I got really curious about polar Nazi bases, and I did find academic journal stuff that discusses these. So there, there were uh, polar Nazi bases. I don't know what to make of that, other than maybe it's just a base. Right. I don't think it has, anything, it has anything to do with aliens or any of that bullshit, but uh, it is interesting. And the setting here is interesting because, you know, I guess most people have never seen the poles. They no, they never will see North and South Pole, so they don't know what to expect. And again, that also doesn't prove flat Earth, by the way, the fact that most people haven't seen it. So... Then we have the whole debate about who was and wasn't infected, right? Uh, the second act of the film. And, you know, there's debates about who had access to the blood bank, um, who did it. I think it's supposed to be, uh, if you watch Rob Ager's videos, th those are good, by the way. Um, he has some good videos on uh, debates about who was infected. So we're not going to spend all day debating that, and it's it, sometimes it's it's a little hairy anyway. But you can you can watch Rob Eggers' videos, and somebody wrote a bad review of my podcast or my book, one of the two. I can't remember. And they said uh, Jay Dyer rips off Rob Eger. No, actually, uh, I argued with Rob Eger years ago in comments on his videos about whether movies like Two Thousand and One and Eyes Wide Shut had any conspiratorial or esoteric content and at that time he said no uh, now he has kind of uh, uh, admitted in some places that there is um, I think Rob Egger had a good analysis of 2001 but uh, here's a news flash if you write a book or something academic and you use footnotes where you cite people that's not ripping people off that's called attributing sources right <laughs> that's standard in writing so whoever gave might have been i don't know some hater that gave me a bad review and said everything is ripped off of it actually no it's it's not true um i was aware of all of this stuff long before there was uh blogs and websites that wrote esoteric movie analyses i was doing it before Vis vigilant citizen years before vigilant citizen was doing it 11 years ago and the only person i'm aware of that did it before me was michael hoffman and he did an analysis of conspiracy theory the dick donner mel gibson movie so news flash i was first i can brag about that certainly there were people doing movie analyses but who did esoteric movie analyses nobody and here, here's some some counter signalers are going to try to shut me up in the uh, chat. Be like, uh, there was a dude one time. Uh, he did it. Uh, but yeah, no, John, uh, John, uh, Rob Eger has some good stuff. I, I've never, never dissed or hated Rob Eger. But um, Kurt Russell kind of solves this, I think. You know, at one point he's like, you had the keys. It had to have been you. Right. And um, so... You know, it was the guy who had the keys. That's who poisoned the blood bank. Pathogens, right? Bioweapons. It imitates other life forms. It absorbs them. So it's parasitical. Uh, they have the debate over who's infected. This, this is basically the entire second act is that whole debate scene, right? A lot of Doobie Brothers uh, look in this. Everybody has the Doobie's bro Doobie Brothers look. Uh, basically the entire crew. Except for the black guys who have the black guy 80s mustache. Always have the black 80s man mustache. Um, but anyway, that's not really pertinent. Is it a reference to the AIDS? Maybe. 
because it is blood tests, right? Kurt Russell's, I know I'm human. Let's do the test. There's a neat thing, though, about the test scene, which is what I do want to mention this, which is what give rise, gives, gives rise to the debate, is the poster, right, on the background behind Kurt Russell. Uh, the poster says, I'm looking for an image of it. I'm not seeing an easily accessible. But anyway, when he's doing the blood test scene, the poster behind him says they're not labeled. So are we supposed to think they're mislabeled? Uh, an interesting possibility. Interesting analysis. And of course, Ager goes into a lot of depth with that. So, um, it wants to hide. It wants to be a mole. It wants to not be out in the open. Again, height of the Cold War, commie subversion. I mean, John Carpenter, I don't think is a neocon per se, maybe. But um, he did uh, write an episode of Crowder, Louder with Crowder, when there was an episode apparently written by John Carpenter. Or he's credited. That's interesting. So it could be that John Carpenter had a Cold War type view. However, if we watch They Live, the narrative of They Live is not very neocon Cold War, is it? Because it kind of verges on being somewhat commie. Then again, neocons come from Trotskyites, right? So anyway, I'm not saying John Carpenter is a, a commie or a Trotskyite per se. I don't actually know his political views, but I'm just discussing the Cold War setting of the thing. And as I've talked about many times, you know, if you study film analysis and geopolitics and propaganda, you'll know that um, we've talked about Twilight Zone, right? Which the thing is is a, is in the vein of classic sci-fi Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone had a lot of uh, Department of Defense consulting on it, and that was because they wanted to raise the the threat of the um the commies and the commies have the ability to absorb and take over and hide amongst us the commies are everywhere and then that becomes magically the war on terror doesn't it they're everywhere they're hiding amongst us they're hidden well i don't think i buy all that but no one trusts anyone we're atomized. Interesting. So this little microcosm of society of the geopolitical spectrum of the time, it becomes anarchic, chaotic. They go nuts and they don't trust each other. And that is part of the psychological warfare of the entity. It causes them to be uh, paranoid, parasitical, demoralized. It's like this alien parasite entity has a master sense of psyops, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And again, this is exactly what was going on uh, in the Cold War uh, on many levels real, right? There were communist tyrants. There were uh, uh, subversion elements. There was all this going on. But at the top, we know that this was uh, an engineered dialectic and trialectic, right? Communism, fascism, socialism, capitalism. They're all uh, the same quadrilectic. And ultimately, it was the forces of capital, it appears, behind most of it. At least that's my thesis. That's the Sutton thesis. That's more or less what Quigley says. Now, uh, remember too, by the way, uh, if you do send a super chat, don't say mean things because now... Uh, super chats that are accompanied with mean things go directly to YouTube's quote charities. So don't say mean things. Say nice things. So blood tests, they aren't labeled. Yeah, I think everything reduces to chaos and anarchy. And actually this, this producing of this chaotic, anarchic, atomized state is what actually gives the entity its power. That's how it almost takes over, or arguably does win in the end. Um, Wilford Brimley ends up being infected, of course, as you can see, not with just with the Beatus, but with 
the alien entity and he starts building his own UFO uh, presumably either to go back or to bring the invasion forces or whatever and then I think at the end we're supposed to think that Childs is infected right because Kurt Russell says where were you Childs where you been because Kurt Russell's been fighting the entity Childs has uh, mysteriously walked off oh he's like I got lost you got lost in the snow uh, yeah, right. No, he, he, he was infected. And, uh, I think that's what we're supposed to think. Uh, what do you guys think? Do you have a different analysis of the thing? Let me get your thoughts on it. What do you think of my technocratic, uh, GMO, uh, end times warning? from Mr. Carpenter. I'll read a few super chats and then we'll move on to Prince of Darkness. Randy Churchill, thanks again, Jay. Great insights. That was uh, last time, but thank you. Cyberskull, $2. Bazed dog. This is a bazed analysis. Eric Thompson, 10 bucks. Thank you. John Goras says, ET did nothing wrong. Jen Power says more Wilford Brimley picks. All right. Well, we could, we can, uh, you pay me $2. I'll put up a new Wilford for you. Uh, this one goes out to, to Jen. Let's find a good, uh, Wilford just for Jen. Uh, how about Boomer Wilford and Boomer gear? Oh yeah. That would be completely appropriate to this episode because I've got my boomer shirt on. So here's Boomer Brimley for for Jen. And of course Brimley is quintessential boomer, isn't he? Absolutely. So there you go. Jen Powers, two dollars for that. Gabriel R, I get how the communists were controlled in front of the West. At what point did the West lose control over Russia? Um, oh, the argument generally by Russia analysts is when in uh, the late 90s, after the country was once again looted under Larry Summers and the Clint- Clintonistas and the Harvard people, uh, after, uh, what's his name? The Clinton guy, the, uh, uh, Boris Yeltsin. Uh, Boris Yeltsin appears to be the last clear uh, Western uh, asset. There's no question about it. Uh, and then you get Medvedev and Putin. Uh, Medvedev seems a little, a little weak, but uh, you know they obviously don't like Putin. Um, is Joseph P. Farrell still Orthodox? If not, do you know why? Uh, no, he is a Gnostic. He produ- He believes in a form of Platonism. Uh, his reasonings, I'm sure, are in his later books. So um, he argues for uh, things relating to Gnosticism. William Kane, five dollars. Did the thing kill aliens in the down spacecraft, or is the thing the actual pilots? Ooh, good question. Uh, the thing, uh, I think, is what landed here. I think we're supposed to think that because it's another outpost that was studying them, or Presumably they'd been there for a long time, right? Because they find like a giant chunk of ice and they thaw it out. Was Childs or Kurt Russell a thing at the end? Uh, I think Childs. That's my immediate take on it. I could be convinced otherwise, William Kane, but pretty sure we're supposed to think it's Childs because of the fact that that Kurt Russell says, where'd you go, bro? Where you been at with that black man mustache in the 80s, dog? Black man mustache in the 80s getting infected with. No, that's that's pulling up Wilford Brimley's mustache. And Wilford Brimley, Wilford has shaved his walrus stash for this movie. So we get Isaac from uh, Love Boat. That's a good one. There we go. Man, I mean, every, 
every black dude in the 80s. I don't even think I sent that one guy a book who uh, who figured out if, if he, he, maybe he already had the book, but uh, I was going to give a book out to the person who could name black 80s actors that didn't have the 80s black guy mustache. Uh, some guy did, by the way, but John the Savage, $2. Mean things. Mean things. What's mean things? Maybe I've already gone past that and I don't, I don't remember what I'm talking about. Anyway, let's move on to Prince of Darkness. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. I love John Carpenter's soundtracks so they were super easy. Do, 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 do. Matt Jones, it, so it was you? Okay. Send me a message. The uh, contact form, by the way, at Jay's Analysis does work. Maybe I did send you. Did I send you a book? I can't remember. But I did fix the the contact page at Jay's Analysis, so you can now send me a contact message. Da, do, do, do. Da, 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 da. Ooh. Ba, da, da, da. Ah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> All right, get out of here, Wilford. You're no longer. <clears throat> You're no longer part of the narrative, Wilford. Get out of here. Brimley. Take your beatus face elsewhere. And by the way, do you know the Beatles were singing about Wilf- Wilford Brimley? He is the walrus. Did you know that? Little known fact. All right, let me clear out some of these images so we can get <clears throat> we can get this shit going, dog. Get out of here. Yeah, Wilford Brimley faces everywhere. Has there ever been this great of a collection of Wilford Brimley? So we could do a whole stream, just like the Wilford Brimley stream, and it'd be nothing but. His past and memes about him. Oh yeah, Ghost of Mars. Forgot about Ghost of Mars. Not that good of a movie, but but funny. <clears throat> is, uh, is Ice Cube in Ghost of Mars? I can't remember. Prince of Darkness. Okay, this so this is the second in the Apocalypse Trilogy. Apocalypse Trilogy. <clears throat> Followed by In the Mouth of Madness. I got red hairs all over me. Uh, the pilot to Prince of Dark. The plot is so wacky and over the top. Uh, I think it does bear forth analyzation. Um, in this treasure, Carpenter treats us to a blender mix of faith meeting reason. Quantum physics meets Newtonian physics. Satanism and Gnosticism in the Vatican. One giant smorgasbord, guaranteed to satiate the campiest palate. This is my analysis that I wrote. Still good, by the way. Added bonus, writer Martin Quartermass is none other than John Carpenter himself, referring to the old uh, Quartermass British science fiction series. Professor Quartermass, double, double bonus. School might be out for summer, but the tension is just beginning because Alice Cooper is featured as the leader of the gang of hobo zombies that lock our science team in the abandoned church. Faith versus reason. That's something we often see, isn't it? Now, here's some weird stuff we start to notice that I think there's some cross-influence, cross-parallels with Twin Peaks. And we're really going to see that in in the Mouth of Madness because uh, the old woman is the Chalfont, isn't she? Yes, she is. And not only that, who plays the Antichrist alter character? No other than Paul Atreides' dad in Twin Peaks Woodsman. Uh, what's his name? <laughs> I forgot his name. But uh, that guy. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But the Prince of Darkness crossover here to Twin Peaks, I'm going to say, begins with the hobos. Demonic hobos. Which is a great idea, by the way. Demonic hobos. Uh, And that becomes a central thesis to Twin Peaks Season 3. And it is present in Firewalk With Me and, you know, other uh, areas of Twin Peaks. And, of course, the leader of the hobo gang is Alice Cooper. 
So school is out for the summer and the rest of your lifetime because you didn't go to school because you're a hobo, a hobo demon. So now I don't know what drugs John Carpenter was on when he was doing this, but I actually love the mix of the madness here of a quantum physics, uh, Gnosticism, Catholic theology. <laughs> it's like what? Uh, Newtonianism, all this nonsense. And uh, Simon and Simon, Jameson Parker himself, notices a Sazigi, which is a conjunction of the sun and the moon. Uh, Sazigi, by the way, is an occultation. It's a larger body of mass passing in front of a smaller body of mass as well as with, that's when, also, by the way, when Amy Schumer walks in front of me, is a larger body of mass passing in front of a much smaller one. And, by the way, Amy Schumer is pregnant. So we the Antichrist actually is about to be born. <laughs> um, who did that deed, by the way? Uh, had to be some sort of insemination. But, in biblical theology... Stellar phenomena, Sazigi, they do signify changes of power and actual changes of geopolitical structure. So there is something to that in biblical theology, especially if you understand partial preterism. Uh, Victor Wong is our Eastern man. He represents Eastern thought for Eastern mysticism. And he talks about how it links up very well with quantum physics. Right, he gives his funny. Where are my notes? He gives his funny uh, uh, talk about the collapse, the collapse of Newtonian physics. Everything at the subatomic level collapsed to ghosts and shadow. <laughs> right, he's Wang in, in Big Trouble in Little China. Oh, come on, Wang. But what is interesting is I think. Carpenter is trying to say, oh, quantum physics, maybe we can work this into how this uh, could play into the end times. So we're getting like the the CERN portal uh, messages from a different, you know, time period coming back in time or something crazy like that through frequencies and electromagnetic stuff. And that's what they're studying. So the idea is that when the scientific steam, or, or team, when they, when they crack this code of ancient uh, texts they specifically reference Babylon, <clears throat> uh, you know, the mystery Babylon, the harlot, and so forth. So, we're getting this. I think that everybody knows that applies to Crowleyanism. That's what's in the background here. The quantum physics, we're going to overcome time and space, right? This relates to Zen and all this stuff. So, it just goes got kind of crazy, but that's actually part of the fun, right? Is that it's not really. If faith and reason do collide in the mad cap collision course. What's the destination? Wacky town. Uh, Alice Cooper and hobos made of bugs. So maybe Victor Wong caused 9-11 retroactively through the quantum foam via Prince of Darkness. That's one of my theories about 9-11 here. Father, Father Donald Pleasance, the priest... The priest, once again, is Donald Pleasance. When does Donald Pleasance not play a priest, you say? When Donald Pleasance was the Illuminati villain in the film Puma Man. If you've never seen Puma Man, you must see Puma Man. And I'm not joking, by the way. He actually is the Illuminati villain in Puma Man, Donald Pleasance, a trained Shakespearean actor, and my impersonation of him is perfect. This is exactly how Donald Pleasance speaks. And he's always playing a priest. I think he plays a, no, he plays in Halloween. I think he plays, he's either a priest or a psychiatrist. I can't remember, but. So. Synchro mysticism, okay. Uh, Victor Wong, who again is Wang, we're going to go back to this for a minute. Synchro mysticism, how's it playing to this? Well, Victor Wang, Wong, 
uh, actually was going to be some kind of theologian. And he studied under a bunch of liberal theologians, namely Paul Tillich, Reinhold Niebuhr, and Martin Buber, and then went and studied Frankfurt School CIA-affiliated abstract work, namely Mark Rothko. And I just bring this in because Wang is a weird character. Wong, excuse me, Victor Wong playing Wang. <laughs> it's a weird character. Uh, and he died on the evening of 9-11. So September 11, 2001 is when Victor Wong died. So maybe he did cause 9-11 retroactively through the quantum foam. I'm joking, by the way. This is one of the stupid... I don't buy into a lot of the, the quantum gobbledygook nonsense. I think a lot of it's propaganda. But um, one of the theories that's that the establishment has put out, I'm not joking, by the way, is the quantum foam explanation of 9-11, which John and Chris called my attention to a long time ago. I think it's in the uh, Huffington Post. This is the stupidest thing ever where they say that that people believing in conspiracy theories can retroactively affect the past. One of the dumbest things of all time, right? This is up there with Mandela effect gobbledygook. But if we were to just kind of play along and pretend like, <laughs> you know, there's some fun stuff with, with uh, the Mandela effect going on, we can pretend that it's something like this, right? When I see Alice Cooper ruling a bunch of hobo demons, maybe I'll believe in it. But as crazy as things are, that actually that doesn't seem that far fetched, does it? Alice Cooper running a bunch of hobo demons, and the Brotherhood of Sleep is the secret society that's been hidden from the Vatican that knows the true secret of evil, and they've kept tabs on it. And what is evil? Green goo. <laughs> um, the secret brotherhood of sleep, however, is marked by the enigmatic phrase. Here is another Lynch tie-in. The sleeper must awaken. This is the message of the brotherhood of sleep. The sleeper must awaken. This is in the priest's diary. And if you watch Dune, you'll know that that's the mantra of dune the sleeper must awaken paul atreides another interesting lynch twin peaks tie-in now i will have by the way my dune analysis updated fixed it's going to be in esoteric hollywood too so you don't have to worry about that you'll get your dune fix uh super dune nerds that Tell me I need to analyze the whole series. I don't have time to read all those damn books and do all that. I'm not doing that. Um, then we get the Horror of Babylon thing. Uh, pure concentrated satanic matter, right? It looks just like NyQuil. So no wonder it's the Brotherhood of Sleep. <laughs> They're like protecting a gigantic... Uh, vat of NyQuil. The Asian computer scientist decodes the cipher, which is written in Coptic. Interestingly, actually, ancient Gnostic texts were preserved in Coptic. Uh, these Gnostic texts describe the vat of green goo stashed in a private crypt, uh, which is the Brotherhood's source of all cosmic evil. And Father Donald Pleasance says, It is substance itself. So, matter. Matter is evil. So we have Gnosticism, quite clearly, Platonism. In fact, Father Pleasance notes that the church, supposedly, this is his, the story here, the church sold people a lie uh, that evil was just a matter of the heart when evil all along was matter. <laughs> so as a result, we may conclude that um, evil is the slime and you can't do that on television and this was the secret that the brotherhood of sleep kept <laughs> it's really goofy by the way um so who is uh, mystery babylon mother of harlots uh, well it appears to be the chick in the movie that gets impregnated right she's the mother of harlots i guess she's not really a harlot but she gets impregnated um 
and they do a bunch of magic squares, esoteric times tables and stuff. And the team of scientists that are assigned to study the Nickelodeon GAC unravel more of the crazy bitch ass algorithms that are defined as evil. And they decide, Oh, this is the anti God, right? So there's matter, antimatter, and this is anti God. <laughs> and it transmits messages through subatomic tachyon particles. I'm not making this up. This is the plot. Um, over time and space. So the, the transmission is from the future, 1999, which inverted to 666, of course. Uh, and the message supposedly is to prevent the arrival of the anti-God in flesh, the Antichrist. I'm guessing that's what's going on here. Apparently it doesn't work, uh, or maybe it does. Uh, it's, I, I'm not exactly sure if Simon and Simon succeeds in defeating the Antichrist at the end or not. I'm not sure. Um, we know that he gets, the, the mirror gets broken by Donald Pleasance, who yells out something generic in Latin. <laughs> uh, but the possessed homeless people trap them inside the church, and this actually ensures the birth of the Antichrist, right? Uh, through one of the bland, frumpy, uh, unnamed 80s mom jeans chicks. Um, Alice Cooper goes nuts, starts murdering people. The anti-god, I'm trying to read my old notes here. The anti-god being crafty, vaginal canals are dispensed with and the old magic mirror gateway becomes the choice method of, oh, okay, so it's like he decides to try to come through a mirror instead of natural antichrist birth I, I I'm, I'm not sure what my notes mean here <laughs> I wrote this analysis to a couple years ago I might have been a little buzzed when I wrote it I'm not sure but maybe uh so Simon and Simon themselves <laughs> himself is also pretty crafty and just like Arnold can defeat the antichrist in end of days uh Simon one even one half of Simon and Simon can defeat the antichrist so he, he foils uh these hobos uh, he does, unfortunately, lose his 80s redhead babe to the netherworld, but uh, this appears to forestall the arrival of the Antichrist. So, the moral is simple and poignant. Uh, watch out for Donald Pleasance. I think he's dead. Uh, watch out for Roman Catholic priests. <laughs> uh, our only hope against the Antichrist is Simon and Simon. So, what do you guys think of Oh my gosh, here, here come the trolls. Gotta get rid of some of these losers. Get rid of some of the losers. Diarbus must be making this up. Have you not seen the movie? Uh, so we got a couple news. So, okay, so let's get some uh, questions here about Prince of Darkness. Your Lossky video was amazing, but broke me intellectually. Why would it break you? I may be too dumb for it. It's not an area of being dumb. Um, you know, I've studied that, that topic for 15 years now. So, um, just, uh, you know, start studying. That's all I can say. What did Dr. Wolfgang Smith say about quantum reality? Um, I don't think he says it's fake. He says that it points us back to the, now, biblical idea. I made that argument. That's in my first book. I talk about quotes from Werner Heisenberg. I'm not saying all of quantum theory is fake. I'm saying that what's put out to the masses is oftentimes a justification for New Age gobbledygook. That's what I'm saying. Um, on a dark and stormy night, when some six foot guys got you up against the wall. He sounds a lot like, uh, oh my gosh, is this messing up? No, we're good. Uh, Kurt Russell sounds like John Wayne, doesn't he? I noticed that too, watching Kurt Russell. It's like he's, and a lot of actors will do this. You'll notice this. They try to, they try to emulate somebody else, which I guess works. Uh, Christian Slater is always acting like Jack Nicholson. Well, I'm, uh, Pump up the volume. I guess I'm going to have to jerk off around here. You know, it's, if you watch Pump Up the Volume, it's really disgusting. 
<laughs> he's always talking about some really nasty. He's like a he's like Alex Jones meets Howard Stern before Alex Jones and Howard Stern were known. That's what the Christian Slater character is in Pump Up the Volume. Well, I guess I'm gonna have to to start touching myself and cussing on my pirate radio. That's that's my Christian Slater, which is quite literally Jack Nicholson, isn't it? So Uh, so Dr. Wolfgang Smith in Cosmos and Transcendence does not say that it's all fake. Uh, but he, he, that's my take on it. Just watch What the Bleep Do We Know. I mean, that's a, a ridiculous documentary that tries to new age propagandize everybody with quantum crap. Uh, but if you read my book and my essays and my articles, you'll notice that I talk about arguments from Wolfgang Smith that reality is has structure right and even victor wong in the movie says this <laughs> reality at bottom has structure ghost and shadow pro dover sean young is gorgeous and rachel from blade runner is human uh okay uh, sean young by the way introduced jamie's last talk when uh, Jamie did her talk a couple years ago, you can watch this on YouTube and it was, uh, Sean Young who introduced her. So it's pretty cool. Jamie, my fiance, Jamie, she knows Sean Young. Uh, so anyway, Is that all that we have for Prince of Darkness? So what do we have? So we have the movement from. I like Prince of Darkness a lot, by the way, even though it's stupid, it's Gnostic, it's goofy. It's just fun. It's there's something about these. John Carpenter can make these B movies that are awesome. They're, they're fun still. I don't know. I can't explain it. It's just the cinematography, the goofiness, the. The gooey ghoulies everywhere, the the skeet skeet spray they spit, you know, it get, we'll give it, we'll give Prince of Darkness uh, four little John goblets for all the skeet skeet goo everywhere. Let's move on to if it, no, does anybody ha else have anything for Prince of Darkness that I'm missing? Some people really like Prince of Darkness, like there's like a. You know, cult falling for this one. They're like, uh, yeah, it does have some generally creepy elements. The hobos, you know, the hobos. The hobos are creepy, dude. Uh, they can be very creepy. And the hobo woodsmen in Twin Peaks are creepy. So does anybody have any uh, anything else? I guess not. So we've moved from the entities arriving, right, in the thing. Uh, loosely connected a few years later uh, we're warned about the arrival of the Antichrist through transmissions the connection between stellar phenomena synchro mysticism and Victor Wong and then now we move into the 90s and uh, Sutter Kane so Sam Neill is going to warn us about Sutter Kane and his meta narrative break the fourth wall fiction that can invoke entities. Uh, so where are we going with this? Well, we're going right into HP Lovecraft arena, right? I guess, I guess every horror writer is influenced by HP Lovecraft, but let's get my notes. Here we go. So, in the first one, we have the idea of evil coming 
right, the thing. And then in the second Apocalypse trilogy, we have the idea of the insemination and portal for the Antichrist. And here we're going to get the, <laughs> the John Carpenter's version of the Antichrist's kingdom uh, and it actually being started. Um. Obviously, it's referring in some way to a kind of Stephen King character, right? Sutter Kane, Stephen King, obviously. And the idea here is what if the author's writing and work could in, invoke the end somehow? Uh, and there is a lot of interesting elements to this. Now, I don't actually think that that's true. But once again, we do have the Crowleyan theme here. You'll notice in the poster that the spirits are coming out of the page, right? The idea here is where do ev where do writers get their ideas and their inspiration for for creepy crawlies and ghoulies and oogly googly stuff? Well, from their subconscious. And what does the subconscious perhaps link to? The abyss, right? The collective unconscious in some way relates to the abyss. Not just necessarily in the realms of the esoteric, but also in theology. There's a, there's a sense that Father Seraphim Rose kind of talks about this at times. So, uh, inspiration can come from the demonic. And that's really the theme of this movie, which is that the Sam Neill character, by the way, Sam Neill was famously Riley Ace of Spies, wasn't he? He played a spy. Um, the idea here is that the fourth wall gets broken it's what am i trying to say it's not just meta is what i'm trying to say it's me, it's a meta meta movie which is weird uh i'm not i mean i can think of a few things you know shakespeare played with meta narrative it's not new it's been done for a long time but can you think of any movies that are meta meta right so meta would be uh, a movie about making a movie all right there's plenty of those uh doesn't new nightmare Wes Craven new nightmare right I mean it's, it's kind of like that uh, Tristam Shandy that's meta narrative with Steve Coogan um, there's tons of these right the uh, aren't there I'm trying to think of the Shakespeare one um, you know where they're, they're having the play uh, with Puck you know um, I just went blank. What's the Shakespeare with, with Puck? That's meta narrative. You know what I mean? So, but this is a movie, not just about making about, about writing the story, but in the movie, they watch the movie in the mouth of madness. And you in the theater watching in the mouth of madness is supposed to be you watching Sam Neill watching the movie <laughs> Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah. I, I went blank on that. Uh, so this is meta meta. I don't, this is, it's strange. And the idea here is what if we could take fiction and write it into reality and bring about the apocalypse through art and fantasy. So whereas Crowley talked about, Oh, let's bring the, the end uh, through the invocations uh, of the ancient ones and all this gobbledygook demon stuff. The idea here is uh, let's open the abyss through our personal craft of the arts. So the arts here become portals for the demonic and it gets really deep because Sam Neill doesn't just discover this. Sam Neill is Sutter Cain, his alter identity or his real identity. He is Sutter Cain. Uh, the guy, what's that guy's name? The Twin Peaks guy. I can never remember his name. Is the foreign actor. I'll find it here. Uh, Duke Leto Atreides. What's his name? I only, I only know actors by their, <laughs> their fictional portrayals. Uh, Jürgen, Jürgen Proshnow. That guy. Yeah. Um, he's an altar. Or actually a demon. Or the Antichrist, right? Speaking through, apparently the artwork of Sutter Kane and the writings of Sutter Kane are so demonically charged that they have the ability to 
uh, cause dissociative states, we're told, in the readers. And this is why the people who read it, they get double pupils, which is uh, pretty creepy. So I'll give John Carpenter props for that. Uh, so basically the abyss is opened. The ancient beings, the old ones come through. Here's your Lovecraft Cthulhu imagery. By the way, the Predator kind of shows up. One of those guys looks <laughs> looks just like the Predator. Uh, and the idea here, this is some pretty subtle kind of esoteric black magic stuff here where the idea is what if we could, it says, cause so many people to go crazy that we invoke and cause the end times. I'm looking for the uh, quote from St. Anthony. We cause the end times through, here it is, blending people's inability to distinguish fact from fiction. And then once people think fiction is reality, we can cause them to believe crazy stuff. And it'll actually bring about uh, a satanic kingdom on earth of madmen running things. Interesting. Did I go over the thing? We've been here for over an hour, bro. We're doing the Apocalypse Trilogy in order. So, by the way, uh, In the Mouth of Madness is not really creepy. It's pretty cheeseball. I mean, there's a few creepy elements to it, but none of these are scary. Cain, <laughs> uh, Cain and Abel. So, you know, this goes back to the, the initial first families, right, in rebellion against God. Um, the novel incarnates evil as a ritual. Uh, by the way, crazy guys are always, in Hollywood, if you go nuts, you draw crosses everywhere. This is literally every crazy person in a movie uh, just furiously uses a crayon to scribble shit everywhere. <laughs> uh, has this ever actually happened? I'd like to know. If, like the real crazy guy who became the archetype for all crazy guys would just scribbling and markering shit everywhere. Uh, the archetype of the crazy guy, right? The crazy guy trope. Isn't that uh, crazist, by the way? This is, this is stereotyping crazies. It's not fair. Plenty of crazy people do other crazy things. It's unfair to stereotype them as scribblers. But our Antichrist character, interestingly, arises from a Byzantine church. What do you make of that? If you remember, it's specifically described as Byzantine. Now, that could be Roman Catholic Uniate. It could be anything, but... His hell portal is in a Byzantine church. <laughs> uh, what was John Carpenter trying to tell us there? I don't know. What do you guys think? Um, will the Antichrist arise from apostate Christianity? Perhaps. When there is a final Antichrist, we do get statements about this apostasy. Uh, is that what John Carpenter's referring to? I don't know. But as I mentioned, I did want to talk about uh, not just as Mr. Pronchow, the Antichrist character from the Abyss and from Twin Peaks. We also have the Chalfont. If you haven't watched Twin Peaks, in my, in my Twin Peaks analysis, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about, but. Mrs. Chalfont shows up from the abyss as a Catholic, Cthulhuic possessed creature. Interestingly, and not only that, the Antichrist creature's face. Eventually, this guy gets removed, and his face is a portal, 
where else have you seen faces being portals to the demonic? Well, Laura Palmer's mom in Twin Peaks becomes a portal for Zhao Dei the demon, doesn't it? That's interesting. I don't know what to make of that, uh, but a direct parallel between it's in this scene here where Sam Neill looks into the abyss through the pages of the novel, which is interesting. I'll show you this here. Where'd it go? Yeah, that one. What do you make of that? I'm not sure what to make of it. I'm still thinking about it. What do you guys think? Obviously, there's a Twin Peaks parallel here. You know what I mean? Because, you know, portals are everywhere in Twin Peaks. The demonic actions and activities open up the portals. Sacrifice opens up the portals. They open at certain times. People's faces are portals for the entities that possess them. You've got the same actors and actresses playing similar roles. I don't think it's accidental. I think that at times, you know, nods are being given to other stuff. Anyway, what do you guys think? Back to my notes here. So, oh, the insane hobos, right? Insane hobos come back here. They're in Twin Peaks. They're in Prince of Darkness. Possessed hobos. The crazies. Uh, Stephen King does have, uh, apparently, you know, these esoteric uh, elements in his stories. He obviously knows about Rosicrucianism, Gnosticism, all that kind of stuff because it's in his stories. Probably is in some kind of esoteric cult. Uh, here's the Byzantine chapel from the movie that is the portal to the <laughs> to the ancient ones to Cthulhu. And so, by the way, a little side note here. One of the things that's pretty stupid about these these occult views of the end times, the idea that you can invoke the end times by your own actions or that the apocalypse is a ritual text, which is really retarded, by the way. The origin of all that comes from the fact that Crowley was in that dumb premillennial cult, the Plymouth Brethren, that is the origin of the dispensational movement. So, No. The book of Revelation is not a magic text that you can use to invoke the end times. That's completely stupid. Let's see what else do I have in my notes. Uh, Sam Neill played Riley Ace of Spies, which is a fascinating connection. Dr. Richard Spence has a book on Riley Ace of Spies. Uh, dimensional Hellgates open up. Uh, they... Here's a, an interesting quote, which was the St. Anthony quote. If the insane become the majority, the sane will be locked up in a cell. <laughs> that's exactly what St. Anthony says, right? And then uh, that's one of the key plot drivers to this narrative, right? Is that the kingdom of Antichrist will bring about the majority being insane. Uh, meth kids, <laughs> just like in the first one that we did, the thing, there's all these kids with like meth, they look like meth heads. Where's one of these kids? And so basically the kids are all turned into demon possessed meth goblins. I had a good picture of one of these kids. Where did it go? Which by the way, echoes village of the damned, right? John Carpenter, right? Uh, and they've got like meth sores all over their face. I, now I can't find it, of course, but uh, where's those kids? The kids are meth addicts. The movie that we're all watching inside the movie of a movie is 
in the mouth of madness. Uh, Antichrist comes from within the church. And it's actually Sam Neill himself, or the John Trent character who is Sutter Kane, who has dissociated. Uh, they say that about him. So when he goes to Hobbes End, which is his novel, uh, he's actually going into his inner psyche, right? His inner soul and enters into the abyss through that portal. Charlton Heston plays his agent at Arcane Publishing. Uh, not sure what to make of that. Uh, Charlton Heston, interestingly, uh, was friends with Dr. Jolyon West. I think I read that in Jolyon West's Wikipedia page. Um, not saying that that makes Charlton Heston a bad guy. I'm just saying it's an interesting thing that I read one time on the page. But... Uh, uh, is his altar here the Antichrist? I think that's what we're supposed to think, right? This this Antichrist character is his altar. Um, the Hispanic chick, Styles, which is a dumb name. Uh, Styles is kind of like the new bride or something. I don't know. But uh, she's the, the whore of Babylon, I guess we're supposed to think. She's the new evil Eve, evil Lynn. The kids look like they have more gallons. They, they're like, you know, red licorice whip cords growing out again. They've got meth sores all over their face. They look like they've got more gallons or something. I don't know. But, um, we see predator looking creatures, Lovecraft, Cthulhu. Uh, yeah, I think that this suggests, you know, some pretty deep esoteric stuff. Um, Stephen King seems to write this into his stories. If you think about uh, the Dark Tower series, right? The tower is like the, the spiritual realm and you can step in through different doorways in the tower and this is people's psyches, right? It's kind of outside time and space, but you can step into different people's bodies. This is possession, basically. Um, and uh, I think that's what King is talking about. I think John Carpenter is referencing that kind of Stephen King type of idea here everybody goes schizo and has paranoia and gets two pupils which i think just signifies double think double mindedness um in a kind of par parsons crowley babylon working type thing they open up the abyss uh the abyss seems to be opening up in everybody's psyche through reading this this demonically charged book, basically. So it's Hollywood, and, and, it, and it really, what I think is the most powerful aspect of the film is that it's not just through the Sutter Kane novels, but it's at the end of the film when they say that the novel is about to be transformed into the book, right? The Hollywood blockbuster. Uh, and that's when it, the, the, the SH, it hits the fan. And then we get the meta meta narrative with the story within a movie within a movie. And once again, it's that we're told that the, the humans are mutating. Uh, Vigo, if you remember Ghostbusters 2, the guy that plays Vigo, he's in this as one of the, the demon creatures of the town. And he says the humans are mutating. They're turning into goblin people. What does he say? People are mutating. Well, people are mutating. That was the theme in The Thing. It was kind of a thing in Prince of Darkness. <laughs> There's people mutating in that, right? Uh, it's in Invasion of the Body Snatchers in the 1970s. And the people are mutating in, in the Mouth of Madness. People are mutating now. <laughs> they are mutating into crazed goblin creatures. GMO goblin creatures. So, uh, that's my take on, on this evil spreads. Uh, 
basically reduces society to anarchy. And what is super successful in spreading this evil? Hollywood. So, once again, John Carpenter, even if he has his Gnostic tendencies, seems to be telling us quite a bit of truth, doesn't he? It seems to ring true. Um, what do you guys think? So, we've, we've gone for an hour and a half, about 30 minutes on each movie. It's pretty good. Um, any more literal goblins, folks? Any more super chats? If not, maybe we'll call it a night. Um, if you guys want to hang out with me a little bit later, I'll probably go on my Twitch stream. Uh, I can, let me add my Twitch stream below. If you guys want to also follow that, I do want to have the Twitch as a backup. So, uh, a lot of people who were watching me on the Twitch stuff uh, last week, oh man, where'd it go? Twitch TV. Uh, they requested certain games. They were like, we would like to see you hang out and play, uh, what did they say? Hitman, um, Black Ops, that kind of stuff. Because I was playing I was playing Tomb Raider, Womb Raider, and nobody, here's the, the link to my Twitch there. Uh, nobody cares about, I'm also going to add the Twitch link right here below to the show description. So you can follow me there. So I'll probably be playing that later uh, because uh, I spent two days on John Carpenter now. I'm a little tired of it. Got to take a break. Do something else. But any more super chats? If not, I think maybe we'll call it a night. No more Wilford Brimley requests. If you pay me money, I will give you whatever you want Brimley wise. What do the what do the people want when it comes to Brimley? Right? What do the people want? Battlefront two. I have Battlefront two. I can play that. Um, all right. Well, this was fun. We had a good audience here. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you haven't seen these movies, they're a lot of fun. They're worth watching. They'd be great for the upcoming Halloween period. Um, I will be doing a Halloween stream. I'm going to figure out something stupid costume wise, and I'll give you guys a Halloween stream, which will be some of the Halloween movies and some other B horror movies that I think will be a lot of fun. Uh, and otherwise, God bless you guys. Hope you have a good night. Subscribe to Jay's Analysis. Look for my new book. Check out the stuff that's uh, new at the website. Uh, all the talks and articles, archives and all that. Be sure and subscribe below. Click like. Share this show. And click to get the notifications. The little notification button. Push your little buttons. Be good little boys and girls. And have a good night. And I'll talk to you soon.